Welcome everyone to this panel discussion on the media and the traditional arts, which is part of Trad Talk, organized by Trad Ireland. Um, this is Toner Quinn here. I'm the editor of the Journal of Music. I'll be chairing this discussion. And we have a panel of three people who are all very well known in Irish traditional music. Peter Brown is an Illan Piper and was a producer presenter with RT Radio for over 40 years. One of his main areas of work was with traditional music and song on RT Radio 1 from the long note in the late 1970s to the rolling wave, which he presented from 2006 right up to his retirement in 2018. Paula Carroll began working in radio in the 1990s on Claire, Claire FM and now presents The West Wind on Wednesdays on that same station. And Paula is also an independent producer of documentaries and features for both local and national radio. And Ellie Byrne spent 18 years as press and performing arts manager at the Irish World Academy of Music and Dance at the University of Limerick. And she formed her own company, EB Promotions in 2014 and provides management, PR, album and tour promotion services to a range of artists. She's worked with Alton, Declan O'Rourke, the Martin Hayes Quartet, uh, Derry Farrell, Karen Casey, so many more. And so you're all very welcome, panel, Paula. Donor. Thank, 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 thank you. Peter, it's great to have you here for this discussion. I don't think a discussion on the media and the traditional arts takes place very often. So it's great that we have this opportunity provided by uh, Trad Ireland. So I thought I'd start by really with the report because Trad Talk this year is marking the publication of the report Navigating the Traditional Art Sector in Ireland. Um, it's research carried out by Jack Talty and it's published by Trad Ireland. And it's a 179 page report with dozens of recommendations about what, what needs to be done in the traditional arts. And Jack, I think he says in the introduction, has organized the content of the report in order of the discussions, the prominence of particular topics in the discussions that he had with traditional artists. So the very first section is careers and incomes and the vulnerability of, um, or the insecurity of traditional arts careers. That's the first section. And then the, the second section is media coverage, which actually surprised me that it was so important to traditional artists to traditional music singers and dancers and right at the beginning of the section on media coverage Jack writes many of the traditional artists and commentators who participated in this research discussed insufficient media coverage as a major challenge encountered by the traditional art sector in Ireland today he continues while radio and tv were listed as the main sources of frustration for artists, the print media's decreasing coverage of the traditional arts was also noted. So that's quite a big statement right at the beginning of this section on media coverage in this new report. And I guess my first question is, and maybe I'll start with Ellie on this one, is do you agree with that statement, Ellie? Do you agree that it's a major challenge for traditional artists? that um, there's insufficient media coverage of tradi the traditional arts? Um, it's, it's, it's a difficult question to answer in that um, there are areas, certainly the print media has become increasingly difficult to try and penetrate in terms of getting traditional music coverage. Um, the only sort of consistent print media coverage that, that was in existence up until maybe two or three years ago was the Irish Times and obviously the Journal of Music, which is, a, which is an invaluable resource for so many of us, not just a traditional musician in traditional music, but um, the Irish Times was, had a regular um, traditional music listing, which was invaluable. Um, and it was a, it was a go-to for anybody who was interested in, in live music or in fact in traditional music recording. The, uh, the, uh, event listing section for traditional music in the Irish Times was in danger of being scrapped entirely um, about three years ago. And um, 
there was sort of uproar. Um, and a couple of us, Connor Burns really spare, spearheaded the, 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 the um, sort of the drive to have the listing um, um, maintained. And in fact, it was after, after quite a, a vociferous campaign by several traditional musicians and, and media practitioners like myself. It, while they maintained the listing, it has become increasingly difficult to get. I think there used to be, Siobhan Long had a column that used to include maybe 40, 40 uh, events that appeared every week in the, in, the, in the Irish Times listing. It's now down to two, maybe one at most. Some weeks it's not there at all. So that's just one um, sort of really valuable re resource that's now not available any longer. And it was crucial to, to so many traditional musicians. So can you understand their frustration? Do you think that statement there stands up? I, I do, uh, unfortunately. Um, uh, you know, there are specialist um, publications like, like the uh, Irish Music Magazine, but they're, in itself it's niche because it's, it's, um, it, 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 it doesn't have a broad appeal in terms of, uh, of consumers outside of traditional music. Um, you know, apart from the, the, the listings section of the Irish Times, trying to get editorial coverage um, for traditional music in the Irish Times is all but impossible now. Not alone does the media um, promoter, myself or whoever else it might be, have to pitch to Siobhan Long, who's the traditional writer in the Irish Times. She then has to go and pitch it to her editor. So it's a two, it's a two-fold problem. You have two hurdles to overcome. And Siobhan, and by her own admission, it just finds it increasingly difficult to get space for editorial for traditional music. Um, okay. In the in the statement there, it says though that um, it mentions that TV and radio, in particular, that traditional artists are frustrated by that. So maybe Paula, if I come to you for that, can you understand why they're particularly frustrated by TV and radio, and then print comes after that? Um. Yes, because I suppose TV and radio would naturally be musicians' mediums, media, uh, more so than print. Um, but I suppose I live in a kind of a bubble, you know, because I, I work as a specialist music broadcaster on a local radio station, which has had 30 years of a very intensive uh, coverage of traditional music. It's five days a week. It has often been six days a week. And we'd often be looking for material. Um, so, you know, like we, we provide loads and loads of coverage. We are, of course, local. So when local radio started 30 years ago, that meant we were only heard within County Clare and, and surrounding counties. But that has completely changed now. And because we have the internet, we have social media, we have podcasts, so the reach of any uh, music program is so much broader and so much deeper than it was. And I think that musicians may be missing that. I think we're, uh, for a good reason, quite obsessed with getting national coverage because there is a sense that if you get national coverage, you kill a whole load of birds with one stone, you reach absolutely everybody and no locals organ or podcast or independent production could do that. But I think that is less and less and less the case. Um, so I, I think there's an awful lot of untapped potential in terms of the media coverage on radio. Anyway, I can't really speak for television, but the, the, um, the audio coverage that musicians could be getting is, is untapped, I think. Do you think that the figures add up when you take a local radio station and its global reach for something like Claire FM? Would there be equivalent figures? Like, you know, if they got some neat national coverage, would do you think when you combine everything that Claire FM could achieve, do you think it would be equivalent? Um, it depends on what you're after. I think we have to recognize that traditional music making is in fact a niche activity. It's not pop, it's not rock, it's, it's not country and western. And sometimes you are better off reaching an engaged niche 
audience and I use the word niche advisedly because you may only be reaching a small audience anyway on your national broadcaster. I'm not saying that a station like Claire FM can compete in terms of reputation or cachet, we'll say, with the public service broadcaster in Ireland. They can't. But uh, what I am saying is that landscape is changing dramatically. And in terms of what a musician wants, which is really to get presumably income through either CD sales or uh, numbers at concerts or touring, I think that there is a potential there for reaching audiences through other avenues besides just the national broadcaster. Okay. And Peter, um, what do you think of that statement? Insufficient media coverage. I mean, you worked in RT Radio for 40 years and you know, a report in 2020 from, tradi from traditional artists saying this insufficient media coverage, a major challenge for the traditional arts sector today. What do you think of that? Yeah, no, <clears throat> I'm, I'm gone from RT, so I don't speak for them on that. Yeah. I wonder in the sense, I think Paul has a very good point there in, in that tradition. I'm a traditional musician, I live in that world. And, and to me, it's everything. And I could always say there's not enough of it. But when I look at it from outside, it, it is it is a niche activity and okay you can talk you could talk in some depth you, you could separate the discussion about between television and radio and then what type of programs you, you would you would like to see made you know there are programs of music and there are programs about music such as the documentaries that that paul would make mm -hmm. so just just to you you, you can you probably discuss that later but just to say about this report if there is a good sort of representative body come from from all this endeavor. And it's able to make a sort of a, a, a cogent representation to RT as it would be the case. It, it, something that, that will make sense to the people you're trying to talk to and trying to engage with. Then there might, there might be some good come from that or some sort of it increased representation for traditional music. But, you know, it's, it's just talking about RTE and there's a lot of RT in the book. That, that is not, that's not the, 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 the be all and the end of it. I think as Paula says again, this is changing greatly. In, in I know younger players and for, where they get their music is YouTube all the time and these things. So maybe the traditional music world and maybe a representative body of this just need, needs to, to shift the focus outwards, you know, in some way. Um, the other thing is traditional music itself as we know it is, is changing. Like the, I, I hate the word pure, it sort of reminds me of, of the, the church or something, or authentic is another word that I don't go for, but the core of traditional music for me always is solo performance or individual or artistic expression, and that's changing greatly. And maybe that's sort of being reflected in the type of programs that, that people might like, to, might like to make, program makers, you know? Uh, Do you mean that the music is changing or that the music that's being broadcast is changing? The music, both, both, and one being a reflection of the other. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you look at the way program, uh, if you look at the sort of programs that are being are being made, uh, if if you look at the programming of festivals and that sort of, they're they're kind of rather more mixed. You know, traditional music has become, it's it's more group focused. There's more percussion in it. There's more stringed accompaniment, etc. And and the the. Uh, the amount of space for just a single solo performer or a duet, I think that that's, that's in some way foreshortened, you know? So well, that's, that's, that's something I want to ask you as, as well as all this, you know, uh, it has to also engage in, in some continuing acts of self-definition, if you want, so that when you're talking to the media and you're engaging with them, that you too know what it is you're you're trying to sell them. I hate the word sell, but it, it is, that, you know, because the music business is a business. But to know what, it, in other words, if you're approaching a, a media organisation, RT, but a lot more than that, I suppose, to know what, to to be able to engage with them in terms that they can understand and they know that you know what you're talking about. You know what I mean? But I want to come back to this because something else that jumped out of the of the report at me again and again and again was that traditional artists have this impression that the music, song and dance is more popular now than ever before. Now, there's obviously, you know, the research doesn't back that up with statistics necessarily, but that is their impression. 
as performing artists. And therefore they see this big gap between um, the media coverage of the traditional arts and their lived experience as artists touring and performing or as they did up until six months ago. And is that your impression? Ellie, can I come back to you? Do you think it's more popular than ever? And do you really feel that frustration that why isn't there more about this music on the media? Absolutely. Well, um, I, I, the, the level and wave after wave after wave of generations of young traditional musicians <laughs> coming forward, I mean, as witnessed every Willie Clancy or Fla, it is not commensurate with the uh, level of, of media coverage that the, that, the, that the art form receives in Ireland. Um, and I think one only has to look at the reaction of an audience, a television audience, when trad music does appear on live TV. The reaction from audiences is so much more visceral and obvious <laughs> with traditional music than it is with almost any other genre of music. Um, you mean the reaction on social media? No, 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 just the, just the facial reaction on TV, TV audiences, the facial reaction and the, the, the visceral kind of enjoyment of the traditional music is so apparent um, that it, 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 it sort of makes so obvious the gap between the level of coverage that trad music gets. And I mean, I know how difficult it is to try and get, um, to try and get you know, traditional musicians uh, represented on, on television. Um, Having said that, radio is my medium. It's the medium that I that I work best in, that I rely on enormously. And I think there is, uh, while the level of frustration that has been indicated uh, in Jack's report from, from traditional musicians, I think it, one has to um, uh, really sort of point out the level of, of support that there is there. Now, while there might not be the mainstream daytime radio programs, they're the more specialist late night evening programs. And one of the indicators I found really fascinating in the last couple of years, the increase in UK traditional musicians who have come to me looking for coverage in Ireland because they just can't get it in the UK. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I just made a list of the sort of regulars that I go back to all the time. And I actually mentioned in Jack, talked to me as part of this um as part of his his report and i i particularly um sort of mentioned claire fm and how reliant i have become on claire fm paula carroll and joan hanrahan and, and owen o'neill in particular are just immense supporters of traditional music claire, claire fm is the only um radio outlet that produces or that has such consistent regular i mean it's extraordinary that five days a week there's three hours of traditional music and because of the internet and because Paula and Joan and Owen are so active on social media the reach has become enormous there certainly are outlets Lyric FM has been fantastically supportive of traditional music even though it's Grace Knows program which is a real shame the only program that was dedicated to, uh, specifically to trad has been has been dropped sadly However, Ellen Cranich on her program, because it is such an eclectic sort of, uh, <coughs> is very supportive. Um, the Rolling Wave, every Sunday night on, on RT in Peter's time, and now that Aoife Nick Cormack has taken over, is a fantastic outlet. Simply Folk is another weekly RT program that regularly plays and supports um, traditional music. The Journal of Music, obviously, is a, is a, is a, a, a fantastic outlet. BBC Radio Ulster has a huge <clears throat> trad um, uh, um, sort of a, a profile with the likes of Lynette Fay. BBC Radio Foil, Radio Nagaeltata, obviously. Now, I, one of the things I read in the in the article was that they that traditional musicians felt that perhaps RT had passed over all their sort of remit. Um, their traditional music remit to Radio Nagaeltata. But that's no bad thing either in that there's so much regular coverage with Anya Hensky and Nancy Nikoshtala and we're in the Gaulov. So there are plenty of outlets. One just needs to kind of tap those resources. Um, Can I ask then, I mean, now we're sort of getting down to it because I, I'm, I'm curious about this frustration because that's a pretty impressive list. There's a lot of you know, that's not just one or two. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's an entire radio station like RT Radio Nagoya is mm -hmm. literally giving over a huge amount of time to traditional music, song and 
uh, and uh, all the time. Um, and you've mentioned lots and lots of others there. Two hours on a Sunday evening on RT Radio 1. There's mm -hmm. Ethan E. Cormack's The Rolling Wave, followed by Ruth Smith's The Sim Simply Folk. Yeah. And then we've got the internet and social media. I mean, there's an awful lot of opportunities there for uh, traditional artists to get coverage for their work. And yet the frustration is jumping out of this report. And I'm just wondering about, I mean, I had a look at some of the figures for the actual coverage. Are we dealing with a lopsided situation here? Whereas that unless things appear on RT Radio 1, because that has, according to the figures in February, it has 51% of the ad adult population tuning yeah. in every week. Is that correct, Peter? Toner, there, there's, a, there's an important point there. The, 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 that percentage isn't going to mean anything in this way. I, the, um, the rolling wave had about something like 25,000 listeners when I was doing it per per week and Kayleigh has something around the same they used to sort of juxtapose now they are as someone said committed people but it's it's still a, a very much of a marriage thing because of where it's placed in the shell I think something like Liveline might have had about 400,000 or that you know so I wonder is some of that frustration misplaced about radio I mean so let's say you, you create another slot for traditional music in the week is that going to affect anyone or what's, what's that going to do about anyone and I wonder from Ellie's point of view I'm just wondering um, you know d does that coverage you're talking about how directly does coverage translate into musicians <laughs> welfare be it c sales of CD or, or, or brilliant point is, 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 there a, is there a correlation there so if you put on another program of traditional music I can't see that making much difference you know I also think I hope you discuss what sort of programs you what sort of programs you make because they're diff there are different types of radically different and just as I have but the other thing is television is different and I do believe that RT television there should be one program of traditional music maybe not the entire year that might wear people out but a solid thing something more than six programs that that are generated by the FLA and, and as far as I can see are sort of owned to some large extent they're good like I enjoy them by Colt Skelter Yarn so I do think that traditional music because of its special place in Ireland and because of the idea of creating an archive that television could step up to the plate I again though you're talking about what sort of traditional music because I mean I enjoyed the Late Late Show with Sharon Shannon the other night that was very good but that's that's not to be compared to the pure drops such as Tony McMahon was doing. They're not the same thing. They're chalk and oh, uh, So I say again that if Trad Ireland is starting a, a, a thing like a union, I would first of all formulate a a reasonable demand that that makers of tele and schedulers can engage with and see the sense in, not just to say RT is not doing enough. That's that's not going to get anyone anywhere. Paula, what do you think? Is it down to the type of coverage and is it down to the fact that it's not on the two main stations in the country, or RT yeah. Radio 1 and RT 1 Television, that if it's not on that, there's going to be frustration? Um, well, so in relation to frustration, I think one of the reasons might be uh, the work of publicity is massive now, as Ellie will tell you. To, to get access to the airways, you have you have all the coverage that you mentioned on local, national and independent and so on. But let's say you're not employing someone like Ellie, you're, you're starting out and you want to do, get that coverage yourself. You've got to develop relationships with all of the stations and all of the presenters we mentioned, because that's how you get your influence. It's actually knowing who you're talking to. And that's why people hire uh, brilliant people like Ellie to do it, because she knows everyone, she knows who she's talking to. But if you're not in that league, and there are now like thousands of people making music, everything from people who are able to make a full time living to people who do one gig a month, you know, and everybody and, and that's got nothing to do with the quality of the music they play, because that's the really interesting thing about traditional music is that you don't have to be a professional full time musician to be brilliant and to be worthy of being broadcast. But you could be one of those people who has to do that massive amount of work just to break in. And 
social media, we haven't really touched on it yet, but you're on your own there and you need your social media and you need to be on maybe two or three platforms. And if you're on social media, you will eventually break into conventional media because conventional media practitioners are keeping an eye on that kind of thing all the time. But it is now a huge job of work for a musician. Has the job become bigger for traditional musicians? And it becomes singers? gigantic, yeah. Is, is, is that part of the pro- problem, that it's just become so broad for them at this stage? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I would say, for instance, um, again, just coming back to my own situation, like there are loads of musicians beyond the West of Ireland who don't get in contact with Claire FM, who don't realise the international reach that we have. You know, like I, I've... I heard American musicians say that they now consider Claire FM to be one of the most powerful ways that they have of reaching an American audience. And I'm sure that's the case for RTE and for Radio Nobeltic as well. And Ellie alluded to it in relation to UK musicians reaching that audience through our radio stations. But we're still not getting all the contact that we feel we should be getting from musicians who want that that exposure and it's because it's a hell of a lot of work Mm. so what do they need to do do they just need to pick their top five that they want to be um receive airplay from their top five programs that they want to be played on or that they want to be featured on and just focus on those is it too overwhelming to do everything at this stage ellie do what do you think what what's your advice i mean they could get you to do the work but if they if they couldn't do that, if they had to do it themselves, is it just a matter of targeting at this stage? Is, will that be effective? Is, um, you you uh, perhaps um, they, yes, they do need to target the, the the you know you could you could become completely overwhelmed as I do myself this time. Every time I work on a PR campaign for a musician, be it for an album or for a tour. The landscape keeps changing all the time. For instance, you know, radio producers um, keep changing how they want you to present the music. Some of them only want it digitally. Some of them want it on SoundCloud. Some want the physical CD. So even just to keep on top of how presenters and producers want the music delivered to them. But I think ultimately, and I think, Paula, you, you might correct me on this. There is nothing like presenting a physical CD. I don't know whether you, you agree with me on that, Peter and, and yeah. Paul. I, you, I, sleeve I, notes, I, a physical CD yeah. is essential with the proper cover note. Now I have built up relationships with producers and presenters over the years, and I have a trust with them. So you, you as a traditional musician, if you're working on your own, you really need to, you can't just send off stuff willy nilly with no cover note. And, and I know pr- presenters have, have mentioned this sort of frustration before. They receive a CD with no cover note. Perhaps there aren't even sleeve notes and they're expected to just, you know, you really have to respect that these presenters and producers are being overwhelmed with a whole lot of work. You have to make a personal pitch. And if you can even target five outlets, Claire FM is essential. I, I, I mean, it's, it's always my go-to list. Claire FM, Lyric FM, RT and Radio Nobelta. Even if you can target just those four radio outlets, Forget about print media is just so difficult these days. If you target those four outlets alone with a proper personalized, find out who the producer is, if there's a producer, and you know, a follow up with an email, it's actually quite easy to do. I'm talking myself out of work here, but <laughs> it's, um, you know, narrow your focus and the spread that you will achieve in even targeting those those few is enormous and just I, sorry peter just yeah. wants to come in and make a point there about something you were saying do you want to come in well, peter yeah. well it's actually saying what, what ellie is saying in that sense that what, what always worked for me would be you got a cd in the post but i have to say i if anything i got an I got about a hundred I, th- I think in excess of a hundred per annum but i certainly always you know it it'd be It'd be very unfair to the musician who's put their life into into this or a section of their life if you didn't listen to it through and through. And also, if I, I can't think of any exception to this that you know you you, you would have to play it if if it was half decent put down. And I, I don't think I, I can't remember having not, not 0.1 of a percent would be unplayable. <laughs> that's that's kind of you know I don't know where you, where you'd go with that. But, but so so I I would it's a physical CD. 
it is a press release, that's fine. And also possibly some kind of follow-up by way of a column. And if, if I got something from Ellie, which I did, I would always take that seriously. It would be a serious dereliction if you didn't. They don't go into the bin. But for some reason, sound files, they just appear in your email list and a couple of seconds, they're, they're gone. And it's a more difficult you have to download. And so I definitely strongly, unfortunately, the, the physical thing is, is that, you know. But there is an ancillary point. And if you get 100 or between 100 and 120 or something per annum, you, you can't do an interview with everyone. You, that's, you know, that's not, the, the interviews will all turn out the same. And I noticed that with one program, it, it, the interview was, you know, where the disc was recorded and we're going on tour next week and the engineer was a great fellow and all this sort of stuff. So the tactic that I took just, if it was good music in my view, and you know, there, there always has to be an editor or a gatekeeper somewhere. I hate the term gatekeeper, it sounds like a bouncer, but that's the term used in the book. You, you would play about four tracks and give what would be a very adequate representation of what that person could do and take pleasure in it too, you know? So that's, you know, straight, here is that was programs of, of music that they, they have to be becoming less relevant because there's so much of it around and there's so much on the internet, you know? So I think to make any program, you, you have to, you have to do two things. You have to ride two horses in which you, you may be split apart rather at times. It might be quite painful in your, your middle <laughs> regions, but you, you you have to make sure you're you're serving the traditional music community to, to the full full as you can, but also then having done that, to find aspects of it or topics or or something something that adds a bit of zest that the listener who isn't committed to traditional music but who just is is just has a general interest in life in general that that they will say that's that's interesting. So uh, yeah. if you try to serve those two things in the course of an hour's poem you probably won't won't go that far wrong i would say you know peter you've touched on something there i i just want to bring this in as well you've touched on something there that's really important because we've been talking about you know coverage and dealing with the frustration in the traditional arts in a kind of commercial way you know that it's like you know we just need to get airplay we need an interview but what about the quality of the coverage that's something I'm I, I'd like to discuss as well the depth of the coverage I mean do we have the same depth of coverage that we did have maybe 10 15 20 30 years ago or 40 years ago when you started in RTE Peter has the depth of coverage changed has it become thinner or uh, broader or Paula maybe you'd like to come in there first and then we'll yeah go to um I think well we're comparing chalk and cheese if we try to compare anything from 30 years ago uh, we've said that there's less coverage now than there was, and therefore that would appear to imply that there's also less depth. I don't believe that is the case. I know that we'll say with our 10 hours of music and, and I do a two hour program once a week. Um, I actually nearly can't fit all the, all the music that I get uh, to play. So I am, I am selective and Radio presenters, I know we take our public service remit very seriously and that, but it is radio specialist music programs are a function of the personality of the presenter as well. You are curating music for your audience. So you are putting yourself in there. So it's kind of, I don't want to say that, you know, we, we, we're that our remit is to promote and publicize particular artists it, it's not it's it's to curate a sense of of the music and I think I can think of loads of examples of interviews that still go quite deep uh, where there is more time available I mean I personally am really focused on those kinds of interviews I want to know how musicians think uh, about their music how they feel about their music Obviously, the history and anecdotes and all that is really important, too. But um, I think this was alluded to in the report about the lack of kind of dis a discursive approach to music and exploring who musicians are and what they are and why they do what they do. I think that there is less of that on a broad national scale, but you do still find it. And you know where you'll find it more and more and people are going for it is in podcasts. If I take your own podcast, which is brilliant, um, 
the Irish Music Industry podcast, which Mark Graham does, which is not traditional at all. It's kind of broad indie contemporary music. That is a fabulous program. There's huge, huge depth gone into there. And there are lots more podcasts as well. So that depth is there. But everything is more fragmented now, so you have to search it out. But guess what? Audiences are well able to search it out. They're well able to find it. Uh, they do like the curation, but they will search the Internet. They'll find the stuff that they like. They'll playlist it and they'll curate their own listening as well. Ellie, can I ask you, I'm, I'm curious about when you're, you know, initially starting to work with an artist and they talk about their expectations, you, you talk about your expectations. Is the depth of coverage important to them? When you say interview, do you think about it in terms of short little um, Q&As and long in-depth features? What kind of things are artists looking for? Um, well, it, it, it depends on, on what, what you're doing. If, if I'm promoting a tour, um, as I regularly do, you're very much depending on the local coverage, you know, just listing where, when, and and just to come back to a point you made, I want you asked a while ago if radio play has any direct uh, impact. What I find increasingly, if I'm promoting a tour, and I'm uh, somebody's playing in Glore or they're playing somewhere in Clare, and there's been an item, uh, a track played, and even a short introduction by Paula about the the individual and about. The, the uh, the the event. The following day, the the uh, box office from the <laughs> venue would ring me and say, "God, we did an amazing jump in ticket sales mm. this morning." Mm. So it has a direct, a direct impact. Mm. If a musician has just spent a year and a half and twenty grand on promoting an album, um, they are really looking for a little bit more in depth coverage. Um, radio play, obviously, because it's vital, but. What I always do when an artist comes to me to work on a on a on a pitch or to work on a on a promotional campaign, I do a sort of a wish list, an ideal, you know, if if this campaign is a hundred percent positive, I would hope to achieve the following. And invariably, the ones that they really sort of cling on to are the more in-depth. If I could get an interview on Claire FM or an interview with uh, Ethan Corbett does some great interviews, longer yeah. interviews. If I could get a, an, an, an article or an, a, a, an interview in one of the newspapers, that's ideal. If I could get um, what, what really is the holy grail for a lot of traditional musicians is a slot on some of the talk radio programs in the middle of the day on RTE. Mm -hmm. Now they're increasingly difficult to get Sean O'Rourke was great because he, he was a trad music fan himself and I had built up a great rapport with his producer. That has all changed now. It was really, really um, uh, effective if you could get a radio, if you could get a, a, a live music slot and an interview on main daytime radio on a news chat program. That's, that had a, an instant effect in either ticket sales or album sales or getting the, getting the word out about the musician. That would be really, um, I think, the, the 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 sort of ideal wish list for a traditional musician is to get okay. an in-depth in interview, if possible. And 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 you know, sometimes it happens, but but it's really frustrating. It's more and more difficult to get. Can to I? Get um... Could I bring in Peter? Peter, I'm interested in this idea, just on the same topic, really, the depth of coverage. I'm interested in this idea, and I was writing about it recently, about the idea of a national conversation about music and whether we have one or not. Because we have a national conversation when it comes to politics. We have a national conversation when it comes to economics. And we have a national conversation when it comes to sport, even. But I'm wondering about the national conversation around music and how that has changed and what role the media plays. Do you, do you think about, you know, the coverage, the discussions that you hear in the radio and publicly about music as a national conversation? Are we always going to be in our own little corner, our little niche? And can we actually aspire to a more national conversation? Um, no, that's, a, that's an interesting one. I mean, I'm very interested in music. If I hear a discussion about music, I, I'm, I'm in there. I just don't know what sort of form that would take, you know, or f what would be the arena for it, what would be the purpose of it. it I mean, your, your newspaper, your, the journal does that very well, and I, I will always read that, I'm interested in it. There is one thing, it's ancillary to this, when we're talking about coverage in depth, 
is traditional music doesn't have a language of criticism in the same way that other types of music, and particular classical mu music, have. Now, whether that's a good or a bad thing, by criticism, I don't mean criticism that expresses disappointment, but, but criticism that is analysis, you know. What, what do you mean by that, the language of criticism? What does that mean? Well, it, 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 evaluation to discuss to discuss music in, in a particular way. Like if you read reviews of a classical disc, um, say th there would be much more analysis of how the the player or the singer is is doing it, what way they're interpreting music. I don't see the same in traditional music, and there and there's a need for a different language. And uh, Michal Sullivan used to speak about this. You know that um, sometimes traditional music is spoken of using the the terminology of classical music, whereas in fact it is so so very different. You know, but Peter, when you're talking. You know, I've heard you on the Rolling Wave introduce pieces of music, talk about a piece of music after it's played, and you're using a language of criticism there, aren't you? It's not the same thing. I mightn't be expressing it very well. It's. I, I, and, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you I, I know that it's not because it's, I never went into the area of, of sort of evaluation of it. You know what I mean? Now, the long note in the 70s did that, but th that was a very interesting thing because... The, a long the, time ago. Well, well it, this is the thing now, but there were musicians uh, it, very offended by some of the stuff that was said. It was the first time it was ever done on air. And mm -hmm. I know one person that was actually consulted a solicitor about stuff that was said and this sort of stuff. So traditional music doesn't have the same public sort of evaluation. And, and I'm not saying it's more honest, you know, like pe people may more discuss someone else's music behind their back rather than to their face or in print. And you, you must know this too. I mean, if, 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 if you ask... I'm up to the chair, Peter. I have no opinion on this. <laughs> <laughs> Paula, Paula wants to come in there with, with a point. Yes. Well, if, uh, if as an editor, who, you, you ask someone, sorry, Paul, if, if you as an editor ask someone to review a record, can you be sure they won't pull their punches because they're not going to meet that musician the following day at, at a music festival? Someone yeah. will say, what are you saying about me and all this sort of stuff? Yeah. doesn't happen in traditional music. doesn't happen in jazz. I don't know, maybe because they're universal wor worldwide ones. But that, that is that's a big area to talk about. We have a very yeah. rigorous editorial process in the Journal of Music. <laughs> There's no pulling the punches. <laughs> Polly, you wanted to Yeah, I, I, uh, Peter has hit on something really important there that I, I've thought about a lot and over the years and it is that lack of uh, critical discourse in traditional music but there's a couple of really good reasons for that first of all this music was a community music and over the last 30 to 40 years it is making its way falteringly into the commercial music world and there's a lot of issues to do with that because it, it still thrives very healthily as a community music where everybody knows everybody and where the quality of the musicianship is just as good in the community settings as it is on the concert hall stage it's a really interesting anomaly within Irish traditional music quality is across the board you know, aesthetic concerns among musicians, whether they're in their pub or on the stage, are the same in their own heads. It's just that the aesthetic of traditional music is badly understood outside of the community. And that's why I think we have this constant uh, sidelining of traditional music. We talk about the aesthetic of traditional music, but in language that's uh, more suited, we'll say, to art music or even contemporary music. And I think Peter was getting at that. So we constantly have this uh, debate about, you know, is, is the music innovative? You know, where's the music going? What's the future of the music? Well, music doesn't need to have a future. Music is just music, you know. The, to talk about futures and that is to kind of put it in a more discursive um, policy kind of framework. Music doesn't necessarily need that to, to exist, but it doesn't exist well, well it, the, the aesthetic of traditional music is poorly understood because it's not broadly discussed. It's not broadly discussed because we have this community setting where you do stand to offend people if you give a so-called objective critique of their music. Because I remember Fintan Vallely, he might be the last um, 
writer in a national newspaper on traditional music who on a weekly basis critiqued new new albums and that and that was the what was the newspaper in the 1990s the it was the Sunday the Tribune. Tribune, yeah. the Tribune and, and he wrote for other papers as well I like rem- 15 years ago 15 years ago though yeah up to 15 years ago, but he, yeah. But um, I remember Finton in one context saying it was so, he was glad when he finished because it was so tough to write critically about music, about your friends. Do you know, and I'm probably misquoting him, but there was all of that kind of community thing that you had to face into afterwards. Whereas if you take classical music, it doesn't exist in a community framework. It's played on a professional concert hall kind of context, and it's a really different world. We do have our language of aesthetics for traditional music, but it's not publicly known. Okay, it sounds to me like, um, you know, this this discussion, I can remember in the 1990s, Paddy Glacken making this point about the language of criticism. It sounds to me like things haven't moved along that much when it comes to that issue and those that, that yeah. same, those same points were made. I'm just, uh, we've read, we've just a few minutes left. I just wanted to mention, just maybe to finish up about sort of the aspirations for the future. You know, the Future of Mute Media Commission was recently announced and they are looking for public submissions. So this is an opportunity as I see it for the traditional arts community to actually have, to try to have some impact on public service broadcasting in this country in any case. And one of the questions is, how might public service media be more effective in promoting the Irish language, sport and culture? So we've sort of diagnosed why we're in this situation at the moment. And, you know, culture is included there. How might public service media be more effective in promoting culture? And in that is traditional music, song and dance, of course. So I'm just wondering, to conclude, maybe you could make a few suggestions, everybody, about what if you were to put in a submission what you would say to a future of media commission as regards traditional music what do we need to do are we talking about quotas on on the on the main channels and so where do we need to go with this what do you think ellie um quotas on the main channels i think is a, is a very is a very good um a, a place to start um i mean the the the, the middle of the day um, music programs which are kind of the holy grail in terms of getting um listenership for traditional music are almost exclusively um not traditional i mean it's very very rare that you would hear a traditional music track in the middle of the day and i don't understand why given irish traditional music's popularity internationally and and i also made a point to to um to jack when i was chatting to him for this report that traditional music uh, is always trotted out in, you know, uh, at government level when they're talking about Ireland's reach and the emotional impact of Ireland internationally. Music is always mentioned, traditional music in particular. And almost invariably, when there are international dignitaries in Ireland, it's traditional music that gets performed for them. And yet none of that is reflected in the daily uh, radio schedules um, in Ireland, and uh, one needs to uh, sort of get explanations on a on a on a governmental level as to why that might be and ways that that could be can be remedied. Um, Peter, uh, sorry, uh, Ellie. Peter, what do you think? Do we need to invest in more writers, more broadcasters who have expertise in traditional music, and give them more airtime, or what is it? What do we need to do? Well, just with regard to that report, the, the, the one you're talking about, the, the commission, tradition, music is going to get a very small section of that and traditional music would be even more so. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think it's important for traditional musicians to know themselves what their music is about. And then you can go approach others about it. Like quite, quite Paul is saying this quite true. I mean, it is, you know, for some people, traditional music is something that's you, you, you look at in the corner of a pub when you're drinking a pint. To other people, it's, it's something to help the tourists. And to other people, it's river. That's all very fine. And that, but do, you, traditional music itself is changing. Like for example, Ellie, when you're talking about traditional music being on mainstream radio, and I enjoyed very much those things that Sean O'Rourke used to do, and he did them well. But is that a band, or is it a group, or or is it you know, is it ever likely to be one single solo player? 
much less of it. And when I was doing, as we used to call them, light music programs, you know, I was selecting music for, for, for them and that, I might put in the Chieftains or I might put in, I don't think Alton or Lunas and that, but I would have been unlikely to put in Tommy Potts and less likely, although I listened to it myself, or on a throb iron of sung by someone for six minutes, although to me, that actually represents almost the, the pinnacle of the art form, you know. Quotas, I'd be careful of. I don't know why. If if it, it, it used to happen in RTE all the time that the music industry would come in and there'd be, there'd be a representative body and there'd be a sort of sit down, have a cup of tea, and we'd talk about all this. And we we had an unspoken rule, and sometimes spoken to play thirty percent of Irish music, Irish music of all sorts, you know. But I'd be wary of someone saying to me, "You have to do this. You have to do that," because it's it's crimping my style. And I just remember one red. Your presenter saying when the delegation came in, and it seemed to be usually primarily country and music, country and Irish people rather than uh, traditional music, never seemed to come in as part of those delegations, which is interesting. But I just remember he said to me one time that when they come in and say, whoever it is sitting in front of the table, you're not playing enough Irish music, what they really meant was, you're not playing enough of my music. <laughs> yes, you know, what, okay, um, about, about, sorry, just thinking about music representation, like, okay. There are what we can say three programs of traditional folk music. There's no jazz program anywhere. It's it, it, orchestral music is represented in a particular way, but you'll never see. Wh when did you last see a Beethoven symphony played on television in full? You don't do it. So th there's a, sort of, I think, it a central sound. There were that string of specialist programs because I know I did them for for a good while. All the, the ones on a Monday night in lyric, and that becomes something else. There were special programs on radio as well. And someone like John Creedon does a really, really good program. But the move is towards mixing in different types of music. And that's the way the music world itself is going. And it's the way that traditional music is going because they're subject to all influences. If you go back a hundred years or something, uh, or, or even less, a traditional musicians experience was about a bicycle ride from his or her home, mostly his as well at the time. Nowadays, you, you have the world open to you, and that affects your music as well. So I think that traditional music, as well as engaging and saying there's not enough of this, is to, is to engage in some sort of uh, act of self-definition itself, to, to, have, to, to create the self-confidence to approach others and say, this is what we are. Okay. Paula, I'm going to finish up with you about aspirations for the future and what we should be saying to a future of media commission, even if, if, if traditional music, song and dance is a small part of it. So uh, one of the things I think uh, the media could do is mainstream traditional music into its arts coverage. So it's, it's even niche within arts coverage. So um, to be sure that when you're covering traditional music on arts programs, it's covered in a similar way to opera is covered or, or ballet is covered or theatre or cinema. There are very in-depth discussions in relation to theatre, cinema and, and classical music. So arts journalists and correspondents on radio could mainstream could could be part of that mainstreaming process um i think what the media could do it's part of a broader thing i think if traditional musicians were respected and allowed into estona for instance that's a massive national statement right. on how we view traditional musicians and whether or not they are in fact artists at all there's a national statement being made there and until that changes we can't put uh, we won't ever perceive that traditional musicians are artists in the way that visual artists are artists. So I think that kind of thing. The other way to get equality for traditional musicians is to look seriously at rates of pay. I think the Arts Council document on pay the artists was a great first step only. They did absolutely nothing in relation to templates for pay or advice so I think that's the next thing if a traditional musician is confident that they're being paid something similar to what a classical musician is or a, a, any other art form person is being paid for a performance then that equality is felt in a broad way and it will be felt more in how the mainstream media treats those arts as well. Okay, thanks, Paula. There's nice central big points for us to finish on. Um, so I think we I think we had a pretty good tightly packed conversation there over 45 minutes, covered most of the topics that Jack um, 
raises in his report, which is called Navigating the Traditional Arts Sector in Ireland, published by Trad Ireland. And I think it's going to be available as a PDF, I presume. So people can read this 12 pages on media coverage in that report. So I just want to finish by thanking Peter, Paula and Ellie for really informed discussion about a subject that's obviously very close to the hearts of traditional artists. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Donor. Good Thank job. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, guys. Bye. See you. Bye.